Well, welcome. I'm Amit Kara. I'm Vice Chair for Committee on Scientific Sessions Programming. What an amazing three days of sessions that we just had. And I'm joined by my colleagues who you meet momentarily. They're going to share with you a little bit about what we've learned, what are some of the key takeaways, and really what are some of the you know practice changing science. So I'd like to start with AHA President Don Lloyd Jones. You had an amazing presidential session. We learned so much about your work and the work ahead for prevention. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about that session, Don. Thanks so much, Amit. You know, the, the presidential session is such a special time because we also get to acknowledge and recognize so many amazing volunteers for the American Heart Association. Leslie Limewan, the Brownwald mentor, uh, uh, and our, our dear friend, of course, Clyde Yancey, who was recognized with the Chairman's Award. So those are really special. I hope people go back and visit the, the presidential session on demand because I think there's a lot of wonderful people that we were able to recognize through that opportunity. But as you said, I was always also given the privilege of giving the Connor Lecture, which is the President's Lecture. And what I focused on was that, you know, we've come so far with prevention. We've, we've learned so much about tertiary prevention, treating people in the middle of an acute cardiovascular event to reduce their risk for further morbidity and certainly for mortality. Secondary prevention, preventing those recurrent events. And of course, primary prevention, where we've made huge strides in making sure that we're treating people with risk factors and preventing that first cardiovascular event or stroke. But what I introduced uh, to the to the hopefully audience uh, yesterday was that there's a rich uh, sort of robust now library of data about what cardiovascular health is. And, you know, the American Heart Association defined cardiovascular health uh, over 10 years ago now. And it's based on those life simple seven metrics of blood pressure, blood glucose, blood cholesterol, body weight, smoking, diet and physical activity, life simple seven. And it turns out that people who maintain the full package of those seven metrics at ideal levels into adolescence, even into midlife, live much longer and they live much healthier longer and with better quality of life, less cardiovascular disease, less cancer, less dementia, uh, less cognitive decline, less so many other chronic diseases of aging. And so, you know, it does turn out to be a little bit like the fountain of youth if you can maintain high cardiovascular health throughout your life course. So we reviewed some of those data. And then what I what I introduced, I think, was let's add a new layer to this prevention pyramid. After tertiary, secondary, and primary prevention, now we need to really think about primordial prevention. Don't let the risk factors develop in the first place. And I talked a little bit about how we can do that, which is we need to have a generation of kids who grow up to be healthy parents, and then we'll see intergenerational transmission of high, healthy cardiovascular health to that next generation. And we can truly launch a generation with ideal cardiovascular health when that happens. So call to action, getting people to be much more active with advocacy with their, their uh, federal, state, and local officials, um, but also transforming clinical care to focus more on primordial prevention, especially in our kids and in our young adults before their parents. And then of course, transforming science to think about the science of aging um, and especially promoting healthy aging uh, and reducing health disparities through addressing some of these really horrible uh, structural inequalities that we see in our society that limit people's opportunity for higher cardiovascular health. So hopefully people had an opportunity to um, tune in and watch that. And I hope you'll join me in this crusade. And thanks so much for the opportunity. Great. I think now we're going to hear from Dr. Wong, who's chair of the Council Operating Committee, who's going to tell us a little bit about some of the amazing science related to cardiothoracic surgery. Really, one of the hallmarks I think people are going to remember is is cardiothoracic surgery, we don't get these trials very often, and we had plenty of them. Uh, Dr. Wong, want to tell us a bit about that? Yeah, but it was a great year for surgeons uh, in sessions this year. Some really, really great signs presented out there. I'm only going to highlight a few. Uh, one of the first ones is the AVATAR trial. This is a trial where that really challenges our conventional wisdom. We often are told to wait until someone has symptoms before we think about operating, if they have, even if they have severe aortic stenosis. So this was a randomized trial that randomized asymptomatic patients to either early surgery versus waiting. And uh, when I when I talk about asymptomatic patients, I think they were very vigorous about it. They um, uh, they did stress tests on these patients and proved. Uh, that these were patients that really did not have any life limiting symptoms. And what they found is that there was a benefit to pursuing early surgery. If you uh, think about uh, the types of endpoints that we're always concerned about, death, MI, stroke, 
uh, unplanned hospitalizations for heart failure. Certainly, this was a study that seemed to show a dramatic reduction uh, in that primary endpoint. So very uh, helpful for those of us who are taking care of patients with severe AS and who are waiting uh, to see if they're developing symptoms. I think certainly this, these results suggest that we may not need to wait as long. A second study I was going to highlight is the rapid cabbage study. Um, many of us take care of ACS patients. These are patients who are often loaded early with a P2Y12 inhibitor, such as Ticagrelor. And currently, the North American guidelines tell us that we need to wait five days uh, before we can operate on these patients. But this was a study that actually randomized patients to waiting a little bit shorter time, two to three days, versus those that waited the traditional five to seven days and found a non-inferiority uh, in the primary endpoint, which is very severe bleeding. So bleeding that requires either a reoperation uh, re or a, a substantial amount of uh, red cell transfusions, or perhaps a chest tube output that is very, very concerning here. So no, uh, so this was a non-inferior uh, test re uh, study result, which suggests that for many of us, um, obviously this is still gonna be very patient dependent, but perhaps we could think about moving to surgery in two to three days after ticagrelor cessation for these ACS patients, should they need cabbage, so less waiting time. A third one relates to whether or not we should think about replacing the tricuspid valve, uh, oh, not replacing, repairing the tricuspid valve when we're replacing the mitral valve for mitral regurgitation. This was a very, very interesting study. We often say, well, we see it, should we try to fix it? And the study certainly shows that when you try to repair it, we reduce some of the echocardiographic findings um, later on. So the progression of tricuspid regurg uh, regurgitation, as well as a, uh, the comp composite included death, as well as uh, reoperation as well. So there was a pretty significant reduction from 10% to about to 4% uh, in, in these outcomes, but it did come at a price in that the risk of pacemaker insertion was quite high. Um, in, on the order of 14% in patients who underwent tricuspid valve repair. So certainly something that we need to think about the risk and benefit of before we consider adding on the surgery. And then the final uh, study was a very intriguing study. Um, this is one looking at a posterior left pericardiotomy during surgery. The idea that if we connect the pericardial space to the pleural space, um, during surgery, we can reduce the risk of postoperative AFib. And this was a single center study. It was really testing that hypothesis um, and showed that it did significantly reduce uh, the risk of postoperative atrial fibrillation. I think we'll need a few more studies to really help us understand um, the risks of doing this kind of procedure when expanded to multiple centers. Um, and, and the true long-term advantages of doing this pericardiotomy. But all in all, I would say this was really a session that uh, our surgical colleagues are very excited about and certainly influences the way I practice as a non-invasive cardiologist when I'm thinking about surgical strategies for my patients. So looking forward uh, to the next AHA where hopefully we'll get uh, more of uh, this kind of great science. But let's turn it over to heart failure, and maybe I'll pivot this to Manesh. Thanks, Tracy. And it was a great set of uh, uh, science at the HA for heart failure, too. And, you know, uh, we had a session that uh, many were looking forward to on SGLT2 inhibitors, predominantly what people are calling the, the fourth pillar of our therapy for patients with heart, pill, uh, heart failure. But we may argue that it may not be the fourth. It might get moved up, depending on some of the data we're seeing, or when we start these therapies. And I think Patients are going to need choice and ability to understand that. But there were three specific studies presented at late-breaking session. Uh, there was IMPULSE, which was an EMPA study that started the therapy in hospital. There was EMPA preserved, which is, again, glofosin that had the EMPA drug started, as you know, in, in patients with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. This study shown at, at the AHA was actually the patient's uh, breakdown for by EF greater than 50 versus less than 50. And there's the chief heart failure study, which was with Canada. And it, and it actually was important because that was the study, again, with an SGLT2 inhibitor, but was specifically looking at patient-reported outcomes. And again, really uniquely done. Another through theme I think people see at the AHA and that 
during COVID times or other times, we really innovated some of the science. So, so going through those specifically, the impulse study um, started the therapy in hospital in patients with acute decompensated heart failure that were getting managed and then acutely getting improved. But in about 500 patients, they were able to show a, a pretty significant reduction in heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death. Again, uh, you know, a hazard ratio of below 0.7. And again, an important finding in that if you start the therapy early, you see a benefit, that benefit starts to separate early. And I think consistent with other findings we've seen. The Emperor Preserve study, again, also will, will, has gotten a lot of uh, interest in the evaluation of people with an ejection fraction, uh, an ejection fraction above 50 versus those with 40 to uh, 49. Again, significant and similar results to the overall trial. Not surprising, but important and consistent and gives clinicians at least the ability to say, I don't have to repeat an echo or check an echo before I do that. And finally, uh, I guess I'd say that the chief heart failure study, which was really important because the therapies, SLT2 inhibitors and can in this regard are important. But what we found was that Dr. Spurtis presented a direct to participant capture of patient reported outcomes with a pretty simple tool, the Kansas City um, heart failure questionnaire and the KCCQ. And what was really interesting in that was that there was again, a, a good tie and a significant reduction in the symptom burden of those patients that then ties to those clinical events. And so, you know, in our failure patients with preserved uh, function or what we, uh, you know, I would say that those are very symptomatic patients, difficult to treat. Now, these SGLT2 inhibitors have shown us that you can start them in the hospital. They have early benefits, even with EF over 50 and symptomatically patients seem to do better. So I think those three studies dramatically probably continue to make us feel comfortable with those therapies. There was a fourth study in the heart failure group, which was uh, the DREAM HF study, mesenchymal stem cells, uh, looking to see if there was improvement in any of the functions. You know, I have to congratulate the investigators, a sham control study, several hundred patients, well-designed, well-run study. Unfortunately, no significant clinical benefits that we could see, some postulated inflammatory ones, but they didn't seem to go in the right direction. So fairly neutral trial, Important for us to keep asking the question to see if this can be helpful to our patients, but certainly not yet ready for prime time. With that sort of up, update of, of heart failure studies, maybe Ahmed, I kick it back to you to tell us a little bit about what we learned in the prevention space with the hypertension and other areas. Boy, very exciting stuff. And I, I'm going to start off and definitely bring in Dr. Lloyd Jones for this one. But, you know, the, the hypertension, we, we put it on the first day because we know that hypertension is the leading cause of cardiovascular death in the world. You know, in the United States, what, 45% of people are hypertensive. In China, that's where we started uh, with this amazing study. You know, in China, almost 300 million people have hypertension. It is an incredibly impactful uh, disease. And so, you know, the, the theme here was innovation and creativity. And there was this large trial looking at village doctors who, who are sort of not, not, not physicians formally trained, but were, were sort of paraprofessionals trained. And then they randomized villages. Now, you know, we, we have 30,000 people more that were randomized, um, hypertensive individuals. And amazingly, there was a 37% absolute difference in hypertension control. It was above 50% in those that were in this village doctor-led intervention versus about 19%. So, I mean, that is astronomical difference. And boy, what an innovative program um, to improve hypertension treatment. And we've seen a lot of amazing work recently in the hypertension space coming out of China you know, to pivot, we go from village doctor-led intervention to very creative to another creative model here in the United States, you know, out of, out of Boston, where uh, the group did a, a innovative program using uh, digital health strategies, using the EMR, but then they use navigators. So not, again, not physicians, but health navigators and pharmacists to improve blood pressure and cholesterol management. And they saw a pretty marked improvement in a sizable population and tens of thousands of individuals in their population. And so I think this gives us hope because we know now we know well the statistics about the scourge of hypertension, but what we need is some innovative strategies um, to help you know, impact hypertension. And we definitely got that in those two trials. And they gave us sort of very different ways to approach hypertension and it reminds us we have to look at the population that we're studying. Um, and there's one last thing I want to mention just from this, this trial regarding prevention, again, the lipid space. They looked at uh, high dose omega-3 fatty acids, icosapentethyl. Uh, for treatment of COVID uh, was not successful, but um, it did give us important new data points about icosapentethyl, something that we're learning more about the, the benefits, the, the side effects, what spaces it may be beneficial for and where it's not as useful. I thought that was, was useful. And then finally, um, oral PCSK9 inhibitors, lipid space is now uh, 
is blossoming. We have so many new treatments available. And we saw this small 60-person study, but 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 you know, very thought-provoking about an oral version of PCSK9 inhibitors, something right now we only have subcutaneous and, and possibly this every six-month uh, infusion. So really gives, for patients, gives them options, right? So if this comes to market, uh, potentially giving us options around lipid-lowering therapy. So uh, Don, I'm going to come to you. Uh, I know you were pretty impacted and, and thought a lot about this hypertension work. What are some of your thoughts about the studies I mentioned? Yeah, no, um, it, you really covered it beautifully, I thought. You know, what was impressive was, as you said, we're, we're continuing to see new innovations in low resource settings, the, the China Village study, you know, where, again, the, the, the doctors were trained, but they also provided a little bit more interactive and, and empowerment training to the actual um, patients in those small villages and saw a dramatic improvement in hypertension control rates, as you said, 57% versus 19%, really things that we only dream about previously, right? And I think it, that that expands the theme, as you said, we're seeing amazing hypertension work coming out of China. Just think about the last three months, right? The salt mm -hmm. substitution study, where again, in villages in China, randomized to either uh, a, a potassium chloride enriched uh, rather than sodium enriched salt, uh, salt substitute given to villages or not. And we saw not only a modest reduction in blood pressure, but actual reductions in cardiovascular events and strokes with a salt substitute. Then we saw the STEP trial, uh, basically a recapitulation of a sprint design, sort of, pretty close. Um, and again, reaffirming the HAACC guidelines saying less than 130 over 80 is really the target we should be looking for in pretty much everybody, um, you know, absent uh, symptoms, right? If you get people that low. So, so some really nice innovation coming out of China. But then as you mentioned, the bookend, right? Um, high resource setting, Boston, where leveraging the electronic health record and then bringing in paraprofessionals who can really do the job better than phys physicians can. And again, achieving better, not only blood pressure control rates, but also better cholesterol control rates. Really, really exciting and interesting to see. Yeah, even for an interventionist like me, I was tuned in and, and caught up with it. And I'll just say that, like, you know, what I what I what I found really powerful with these studies, it was, you know, Keith Ferdinand and Anushka Patel in that session really gave great bookend lectures. One about the ways you can improve blood pressure, you know, thinking about substitution, thinking about polypills, thinking about surrogates and others helping. And then I thought Keith ended it well with just talking about the guidelines are correct, getting them into practice matters. And, and, and additionally, I'll just say, he, he sort of also highlighted the fact that even though there are high income or high resource areas and low resource areas, in the United States, there's also low resource areas. And that might get us to what I'll right. say is our, our final through theme, which is really health equity and access um, to care and improving everyone's life in a, in a healthy and equitable way across the planet and the United States for sure. And I guess maybe I'll start with you, Amit. You know, you were on the main event desk and you saw... Uh, what I'll just say is one of the more powerful sessions we've had at the HA with uh, uh, Clyde Yancey and uh, Michelle Albert, our, our incoming president, past president, going through a, a session on on not just achieving health equity, but advancing to solutions. And maybe I'll start with you and see what your what your thoughts were on the take homes. Yeah, that. you know, Manesh, uh, uh, that that's that was such a moving, powerful session. It's I think one that uh, everyone will will digest. I, I know I'm going to have to think about it for several days. It really moved me, and I. I give the, the organizers a ton of credit. You know, their goal were twofold, to take on from last year what we learned from this structural racism, to create this burning platform that we really must act, and then to come up with solutions. And I thought some amazing discussion um, by Sonia Angel about really tangible solutions to make an impact here. We had a really uh, amazing discussion from the whole group of discussants at the end, each giving a sort of a a vignette about what can be done to move the needle forward. So we're not describing the problem, but what can we do? And then the final thing I wanna say is the patient the patient session. I thought that patient video was um, just incredibly poignant and reminds us why we do what we do. Who, who, is, who are we doing it for? So I, I was incredibly moved. Um, Donna, Manesh, what are your thoughts on, on some of those? Or, or Tracy, if anybody that, that watched it as well. Yeah, no, I'll just uh, say that the, um, the, and see what Don says too, but I, I found the, the session moving the patient vignettes is clearly disturbing and worrisome again that this is where we still are in the United States. So I think that was important. When I when I think back to the HA and I think about the moments we hear, you know, one of the through points from last year's this year was Tom Ford saying, like, you know, your your budget is a moral document. So that came into this session, and that's true. Where you spend your money is where you think about what you're trying to accomplish. But this year the, the comments I heard and I think that stuck with me were um were that 
if you don't measure it, you don't do it. No, so the angel's saying, like, if you really want to measure something, you want to improve it, that's in a way and gave really practical things about that. And then a, a strong statement about, you know, if you don't fix it in your house, you can't expect somebody else to fix it in your house. And the academic medical centers and other places that are what I'll call anchor institutions have to invest locally, have to improve health locally, have to think about that. And then that gets to equitable use of, of not just resource, but get people into clinical trials and get people access to care. So those were some of the thoughts I had. I don't know, Don, if you had any others. And I know you've gone through a long session, so I really appreciate everyone's time here. But I think this is an important sort of ending message for us. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, I, that, that advancing to solutions session, it, it, everybody has to watch it. And as Ahmed said, you have to watch it more than once. And, you know, just w one more thing that, that Sonia Angel said in an incredible talk, you know, don't mitigate it. Let's eliminate it. Right. It's time to move ahead. Um, and I, I think, again, you, as you said, powerful quotes that will really stick with me and make me think about what we need to be doing better. Um, the other thing I think we saw, though, and, and, and Manesh, you, you alluded to this, is the democratization of access to clinical trials, right, through mobile technology, right, through the web, through whatever. Um, you know, I think we're seeing that we can actually reach different populations, engage them in the clinical research enterprise, hopefully in ways that they drive, right, that they can see the benefit for answering the questions that they're concerned about in their in their context, in their communities. And, you know, I hope we're going to see much, much more of this going forward, but pretty exciting. We're definitely looking at different ways trials are reaching out to patients. Um, for example, take a look at that Fitbit study. There were quite a few uh, patients who were older than 65 that was participating in these trials. Uh, usually we think of technology trials as targeting younger patients. It's also really nice to see, you know, examples like the heart failure trial, where we're really looking at patient reported outcomes as a key endpoint. This is something that makes patients really want to participate uh, in trials with us. And looking at the spread of clinical trials that are represented here, certainly there are many ways to get many different patients um, engaged in research. And so that would um, enhance the equity of our clinical trials representation as well. Well, I just want to thank everyone for what I'll just say is another great wrap up. And again, I think our, our message here that we ended on, which we sort of started on too, which was primordial prevention and improving health. And the only way we can do that is through an equitable allocation and involvement of people across the, the globe. And it really is central to the HA mission. So thank you all for joining us this year. We really hope you enjoyed, uh, hopefully, however you got to see the Scientific Session 2021. And we look forward to hopefully seeing you in person or virtually and in person, depending on how you can get there for AHA 22 in Chicago. And, you know, I'm going to take President's uh, prerogative here, Manesh, because I want to make sure we thank you as our chair of Sessions Programming and Ahmed as our vice chair. What an incredible meeting. We are so grateful to you and the amazing AHA staff for pulling this off, pivoting to a virtual meeting, you know, but having the really great innovations of the in-studio components, the engagement, the commentariat that was available, you know, to kind of give immediate feedback and lots of engagement with our viewers. So thank you both so much for just an incredible sessions experience. Thanks. Thank you. You're here.